Oh, yeah. We're diving into the controversy today. So, let's go. Yeah, we're diving into a very controversial topic today. Namely, the router plane from Jonathan Katz Moses. I've said it before, I'll say it again, and I will continue to say it. The router plane is one of the most versatile tools in the shop. Whether you are a machine woodworker or a hand tool woodworker exclusively, I do think that you should have a router plane in your arsenal because it can do so many things so well and the micro adjustments are so easy to make on something like a mortise and tenon, a rabbit, a dado. So they are a useful tool to have. And to that end, I have my Veritas version, which is one of the first tools I ever bought with my own money. And it has served me well for 12, 13, 15 years, I don't know. It has been a workhorse for a long, long time and I love it. But there are, of course, other router planes on the market. For example, the Lee Nielsen. This is one of the more popular router planes out there. It is a brilliant tool, but there are some key differences between this tool and these two, and we're gonna discuss those at length, as well as how all three of these tools pull from this tool. The OG, the original, the Stanley router plane, we are gonna compare and contrast all four of these to help you understand what one you need, what one you don't need, if there are any that are better than the rest. So let's dive into it. Now, very briefly, before we dive into the comparisons, let's talk about the history of the router plane for just a second, and a very unofficial in Eric hearsay, off the top of my head, history of the router plane. This tool was invented in the late 1800s, somewhere in the 1880s, I believe. I'm gonna say 1884, that may or may not be true. Originally, it was the closed throat type, meaning that this horn didn't exist. It was flat across the same way that all the other ones are now. It wasn't until about 10 years later or so that they came out with the open throat variation, which sidebar, I hate the open throat, don't buy the open throat, but that's just my opinion, you live your life. But the reason I start back in the late 1800s is because it's important to realize that this tool was not invented by Stanley. There are any number of variations of wood and metal types that were made before this tool was mass produced by Stanley. And that's an important thing to remember when we're talking about design, design variations, ripping people off. We're gonna dive into all of that. But just remember that this tool has been around for, at a minimum, centuries. And in more or less this same shape. A flat sole, a blade that's held in place that you can adjust the depth of, and you can adjust the depth of your dado, the depth of your rabbit, the cheek of your tenon, whatever it is that you're working on. Now, to my knowledge, what Stanley did invent, in this may or may not be true, but at least this is the first time in popular woodworking culture that we know of it, is the depth adjustment right here. This is clutch. This is a huge improvement rather than a tap set. So I can unlock this collar, I can make a depth adjustment, and I can lock this back down, and it's really easy to get a micro adjustment. Now in this video, there are three topics I'm gonna discuss. The first of which is design. So let's compare and contrast this design with the other three. So right off the jump, we're gonna set aside the Cat's Moses for a brief second because it's a little bit of a controversial topic. So we're gonna start with the design evolution of the big three here. With our Stanley plane, a couple of things to note. First of all, we have a straight up and down handle. That's because that makes this casting much, much easier to produce back in the 1800s where you can just pop these handles on at 90 degrees. You don't have to worry about any angles right there. Let's get the blade out of here. This is a dumb tool. Now, as far as our blade and depth adjustment goes, we have the casting ended with this threaded rod that's inserted after the fact. We have a blade that sits in the groove for this casting. We have a collet, which slips right around that, and that locks it in place. And then, of course, we have our depth adjustment knob. So that's four pieces that get added on to the casting after it's done. Now, one thing I've always really liked about the Stanley is the blade assembly and collet. I think this system holds it really well. However, one thing I've never really liked is the fact that it always confuses me whether the knob goes like that or like that. And the thing is, there's not really a right or wrong. However, if the knob is upside down, it's much easier to raise this blade up past the sole. So I've always installed it upside down. 
it's one of those things. It's just a nitpicky thing. I don't like it. Feels sloppy, but also this design is 150 years old. So there is that. Now, one other thing to note is the threads on the depth adjustment are much larger than they are on the contemporary versions. So what that means is one full rotation of the depth adjustment is going to adjust you much further down than it would on either of these two tools. I don't remember the exact number. I want to say a full turn is somewhere in the range of a 16th, give or take. Whereas on the contemporary versions, a full turn in the knob is a 32nd. So something to note. Now, one last thing to note. I said it before, I'll say it again. I hate an open toe. Now, to my understanding, the thought behind that open toe is the fact that you'll be allowed to clear chips better or see your cut better. But first of all, it's a plane. If you're taking chips that are so big they can't clear that hole, you're taking way too big a cut and you're probably not gonna be able to actually utilize the tool. So in reality, all this does is limit my ability to use this tool on edge because it wants to dip down into that hole. And Stanley figured this out, which is why in later editions they added the shoe so that you could close the toe. So it's just, it's a silly design. I don't understand why people still buy them. That's a personal opinion though. So if you prefer an open toe, live your life. Don't let me yuck your yum. Now, that's the Stanley. Onward. Let's take a look at the Lee Nielsen variation immediately you can see the similarities, right? They're more or less the same tool. A couple of adjustments that were made. Number one, a slot in the bottom wherein you can add a fence that stays perpendicular to the blade versus having just a hole tapped so that fence can kind of go willy-nilly wherever it wants to go. So that's a nice improvement in the casting. Number two, the blade housing is actually cast into the tool itself. Now, this may be a controversial opinion, I actually don't like that. I think all it does is it makes it more difficult to get the blade out of the tool because in order to get the blade out, now I have to loosen that up. I have to adjust my depth adjustment all the way to the point where I have to take that out and then I can slide that out of the casting, which fine, it's not the end of the world, but it's just an extra step that's kind of a pain in the butt. Now, the third and final kind of major difference between this tool and the Stanley is the fact that the blade is square to the front of the cut, which doesn't really matter, it doesn't affect the cutting action and it makes more sense for the casting, but I do think it makes for a little bit more of a pain in the butt when you go to sharpen. Not much, it's negligible, but a little bit. Now, one other thing that this tool has that the Stanley doesn't is a depth stop. So I can take this little bit here, raise it up and lock that down wherever I need to make a depth stop. And then I can adjust it down to that depth over and over repeatedly and it will bottom out. I did that wrong. <laughs> As I was saying, what I'm gonna do is I'm actually going to set my depth, lock my piece, take a cut, and lock my depth of cut right there. Now, when I go to adjust, my depth adjustment is going to raise with the blade and when I hit my final depth, it's gonna bottom out on the casting and that's how I know I can make repeated cuts. So that's the Lee Nielsen. Let's briefly look at the Veritas variation. Most of this is the same. It's kind of in between these two. First of all, the major difference is the fact that the handles are splayed out at 45, which again, this may be a controversial opinion, I actually prefer. We are also on this version back to the collet system rather than the locking mechanism that's integrated into the casting like on the Lee Nielsen. And one thing I really do like about this collet system is it's spring-loaded. That's a nice little adjustment by Veritas that the Stanley didn't have. So the blade is always under pressure from the collet. So when you loosen this up, it's not just gonna automatically fall out a la the Stanley. I like the adjustment lever a little bit better because I know which way goes up and down. Unlike this tool, same design on the Lee Nielsen here. The depth adjustment is more or less the same. The reason I got it wrong on this tool is because on the Veritas, you do set your depth stop to be adjusted so that your adjustment lever actually bottoms out on your depth stop rather than your depth stop bottoming out on your casting. So, all right, there was a reason. But otherwise, this is more or less identical to this. And this is basically the same as this as well. These are two different flavors of the same treat. Let us not forget that when we talk about this. Okay, so let's dive into the controversy a little bit. There is some controversy in the furniture world about the fact 
that Jonathan Katz Moses is producing tools now. From my standpoint, from my vantage point, as a furniture maker who also resides in the YouTube space, I'm friends with people on both sides of this argument, and I think, as a furniture maker, that the arguments made by furniture makers are a little bit elitist. I know, some of them are friends, and that's fine. They're allowed to have differing opinions than I do. That's, that's what makes this conversation lively, and that's what makes our country wonderful. Allow other people to have differing opinions, but, but I believe the reason that they are upset about it is because twofold. Number one, they feel like the castings are being outsourced cheaply, which is upsetting for companies like Lee Nielsen, who does all of their castings in the US, and that's fair. And they also feel like the design has been ripped off. And this is the reason I wanted to dive into design in the first part of this video, because as you've already seen, all of the tools are just rip-offs of this tool. And that's fine, there's no intellectual property or there shouldn't be around something like this. All of these things, this is a functional object that's been around for centuries. And so I don't think one can fairly make the argument that this has ripped anything off. Because if you're making the argument that nothing has been improved in this tool, well, you can point to the Veritas for the exact same reason. Outside of adding a spring to the collet, it's the same tool. Or you can point to the Lee Nielsen and you can say it's the same tool outside of the fact that the housing is now in the casting. Also, I'm going to argue that there actually is one really good innovation in this that I really do like, so let's dive into it. So we come to the Cat's Moses. Couple of design points. Number one, the handles are flared out much like the Veritas. You have a depth adjustment readout down here, which the Stanley also has printed on their blade. Now you also have this kind of dual piston locking mechanism up here, which at first glance I thought was a little bit superfluous. It didn't really make any sense, and I still don't know that it's necessary. However, what it does do is allow you to integrate what I think is the major improvement on this piece, which is the depth stop. What I have found to be endlessly frustrating on both of these tools with their depth stops is that they're not super accurate, right? They may be a few thou off here and there. Now, a few thou may not sound like that much, but when you're dealing with shavings that are 10 thousandths of an inch and you're trying to micro fit a piece, a couple of thou can be a big difference. And so having a depth stop like this, which is essentially a locking mechanism with a rare earth magnet in it that slides up to this piece, and then I can adjust down to my final depth, lock it in place, and now I have a really nice positive stop that bottoms out super cleanly on that magnet. It feels to me, and this is just by feel, it feels to me to be much more accurate and does not slide the way that both of these tend to do. And so currently, I'm very impressed with that depth stop. That, I think, is not something to throw the baby out with the bathwater. But outside of that, same kind of thing in the back here with a spring-loaded locking mechanism, which I really like, keeps the blade from just flopping around when you loosen it up. And overall, it seems pretty clean. So from a design perspective, I think that this is more or less on par with the other two. The one visual flaw of this tool, I think, from a personal standpoint, are these big old hex bolts in the top of the head. I don't care for those, I think it's an ugly look. I know Lee Nielsen also has these screws coming through the top. I also think that's an ugly look, but at least these are brass screws that are slotted. Maybe this is me just being an elitist, I get it, but I don't particularly care for that look. Another thing that I'm not altogether crazy about is the fact that you have to remove the blade using a tool, using an Allen key right here. And that just feels like an extra step to me. I don't particularly care for it. However, if you're sharpening this blade, you are using an Allen wrench to remove the head from the stem anyway. So it's not the end of the world, but maybe that's just me being a little nitpicky, but I don't particularly care for that. That is, from a design perspective, the breakdown of these four tools. The second thing we're gonna cover is how they actually work. So, let's cut some data.
What the hell? Hey, ma'am. How you doing? Oh, oh. Dude, what are you doing? I'm averting my eyes. Bro, I'm not God. You don't have to avert your gaze. No, dude, it's scientifically proven that it's irresponsible to look directly at the sun. Oh, stop it. I'm not going to burn your eyes. You sure? Yes, just... I want to have a real conversation. Oh, oh, dude, come on, man! Ah, I got you. I was just kidding. All right, look, I got things to do. What do you want? Jeez, somebody can't take a joke today. Look, Eric, I'm going to cut straight to the point. I've been up in the sky for five billion years waiting for somebody to come and harness me. Dude, what is... What? What? Use my power. I literally have no idea what that means. Oh boy, howdy. Do I have to spell everything out for you? Dude, just go solar. Oh, that's actually super convenient. I've been meaning to look into that. Well, let me tell you about it then. Did you know that residential energy use accounts for roughly 20% of greenhouse gas emissions in the U.S.? Hmm. That includes cooling your home on hot summer days to powering all of your appliances, and yes, running those incessant woodworking machines. <laughs> but with solar, you can power your home with energy you feel good about. Now, let's be real here. Utility rates are rising sharply. So all that stuff you keep plugging in costs more all the time. Right. Googly moogly. Solar is one of the least expensive forms of energy, and saving money is actually the number one reason people choose to go solar. But I can hear you saying, listen, you live in Philly. Pennsylvania is not exactly the Arizona of the Northeast. Mm. But solar isn't just for the sunniest states or large suburban homes. Depending on your system and location, solar can work well in cloudy conditions, cold conditions, and on homes with smaller footprints just like yours. Mm. Dude, are you even listening or are you just making dumb faces right now? No, no, that's uh, not at all. Okay, keep going. Anyway, if you're interested in learning more about solar, my friends over at SunPower are the top-rated residential solar company in the U.S. Really? SunPower provides an ecosystem of home energy solutions that enable American families to easily electrify their lives. Well, I'll be jingled. SunPower is actually known for their high-quality products that you can trust, and they're an American company established in 1985, making them the only U.S. residential solar company that's been around longer than their 25-year warranty. Well, that was easy. Oh, you, uh, that well, was fast. Yeah, and I offset 126% of my energy needs, meaning that not only is now all of my energy renewable, but I'm also going to get paid back by the electric company. Dude, it kind of sounds like you made out like a bandit. Yeah, it was kind of a win-win. Well, I guess my job here is done. I'll just go back to feeding trees now. Right on. Thanks, my dude. So a huge, huge thanks to SunPower for helping me go solar and for partnering with me on this video. So if you want to learn more about what going solar would look like for you, how much it could save you in the long run, and about SunPower as a company, click the link down in the description. Now, let's get back to router plane, shall we? So. What I've got here is a board of poplar with four knife walls on it ready to be turned into dados. Each one is marked very clearly with which tool I'm going to use. So I'm just gonna cut a dado maybe an eighth of an inch deep, something like that with all four of these tools, see how they function, see how they feel in the hand, and uh, then we can compare and contrast. From a tool in hand functional perspective, there are a few very minor differences between the four tools. So let's start with the worst, in my opinion, the old Stanley. Now I'm not trying to be controversial when I say that, it's just a personal preference. The castings are old, I've already told you I really dislike this shoe from a functional standpoint. And the locking mechanism in the threads are so coarse and so unrefined that I find the depth adjustment is really difficult. There are times where I don't even adjust the depth 
I just loosen the locking mechanism and relock it, and that adjusts the depth for better or for worse. And while on these three, I would tend to take like a quarter of a turn or maybe a light half a turn, this one is so coarse that it really is like a 30 second of a turn to go down just enough to be able to continue making cuts. So for what it's worth, that's why I don't like this one. That's why this one sits over here in last place. The differences between these three tools are so minor, it's really quite difficult to actually rank them best to worst. I've already said I prefer the splayed out handles. For some reason, I just think that I have better leverage. It may be a preference thing. It may be that I've been using this tool for over a decade and so that's now what my body prefers. But when I'm actually making a cut and when I'm rotating the tool, I feel like I have a better ability to rotate with more leverage on a wider angle. That's just me. Consequently, I feel the same about this tool. I feel like I have really good leverage out here. I think these handles are ever so slightly further in than the Veritas, but we're, we're talking a negligible amount. I still find the depth adjustment on these two tools to be eh, to the point where I never use them when I'm actually working. I just make all of my rough cuts and then I set it and I take my final depth pass on all of my surfaces. The depth adjustment on this, I do think is really good. I do like it. I think that's a really big positive there if you're making repeated cuts over and over again. Now my one big gripe with this tool, well, I suppose it's two big gripes. Number one, the threads are reversed. And so this is just a muscle memory thing, but when I was going to make my depth adjustments, I constantly would turn clockwise and that would raise the blade up versus on these two tools, that would lower the blade. So that's just a minor thing that my hand would have to get used to, or if this is the only router plane that you own, of course you won't know any difference. My other thing that I noticed about this plane, which I wasn't picking up on originally, is the threads are coarser. Now, they're not quite as coarse as the Stanley, but what I did find is I'm not quite taking almost a half turn like I do on these two. It's more of a quarter turn, which it's a negligible difference, but it is a difference I noticed. Aside from those minor nitpicky things, I think as far as the quality of cut goes, the ability to use the tool, I think these are all very much on the same level from an initial use perspective. Been using this for a decade. I've been around this for a decade. This is brand spanking new, but it seems to do just as well as the other two. And frankly, I think this blade is sharper out of the box than either of these two tools were. Now, lastly, from a sharpening angle, both of these tools, require you to sharpen the blade as a single unit. It's not that hard, but you don't have the ability to separate the cutting head from the shaft. Whereas on these two tools, you can see that there's a hex screw in there. You can actually remove the blade from the shaft and then sharpen it like a normal quarter inch chisel or three eighth inch chisel, whatever that blade width is. So that is, in my opinion, for a beginner, a major benefit because it is a muscle memory thing again, right? It's much easier to do the thing your body already knows than to learn a new skill. So from that perspective, if you're just getting into hand tools and you only know how to sharpen a chisel or, or a plain iron, these two may be a little bit easier to sharpen for you for that reason. Now, we come to our third and final topic, price point. The window for these tools is all relatively similar, right? They're all more or less the same tool, so you can find the cheapest one, which is probably gonna be the Stanley, on the used market for maybe as low as 75 bucks, maybe, and it may be in pretty bad condition. You may need to do some serious work to it. But if you like to restore old tools, or if you just like learning how old tools work and taking them apart and figuring them out, that may be a really good option for you. But in order to get one that is more or less functional, you're probably going to be in the 100 to 150 range, if not more, because they are collector's items now. Just because it's old doesn't necessarily make it cheap. You may have a better time finding a used version of the Veritas or the Lean Nielsen, probably in that same price point, and you're gonna get, in my opinion, a better tool for around the same price. And if you do try to find an old Stanley, don't be surprised when you're seeing a boxed version with all three blades going for $250 to $350. They are collector's items. People will want to keep them unused and try to sell them for more than they're worth. We, as furniture makers and woodworkers, are looking for functional items. Now on the other three, they're all basically the same. 
I mean, we're talking tens of dollars of difference, right? The Veritas runs for about 210 if you're getting the fence and the sharpening stem included. The J-Cats is running around 230, I believe, 220 to 230, and the Lee Nielsen's running at 250. You're looking at a window of $40. Now, yes, if you are very budget conscious, you go for the cheaper option. Of course you do. That just makes total sense. But realistically, on a grand scheme, on a, on a peeled back bird's eye view, it's negligible. So whichever brand you are most comfortable with, whichever tool you think will do the job best, they all seem to function equally well and they are negligible when it comes to the price difference. Here's my final conclusion. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter which one you buy. You should buy the tool that's the best fit for you. Whether that is, again, from a budgetary perspective, you can buy the cheapest new one. If that's from a tool collection perspective, maybe you get the oldie because you love old Stanleys. If you are a fan of Jonathan Katz Moses, go support his business. He's a great dude. There's no reason not to purchase this tool. And if you're just a Lee Nielsen diehard, this is a great tool. It's been a great tool for decades. There's no reason not to have this one. I should mention, in full disclosure, two things. Number one, I worked for Lee Nielsen for a number of years. I did their hand tool events. I know Tom Lee Nielsen personally. He has been a major supporter of my career for over a decade. I have a tremendous amount of Lee Nielsen tools that I got at a discount as an employee. I will continue to support Lee Nielsen because Tom has been a wonderful human being to me over the years. I should also say that I did not pay for this tool. Jonathan sent it to me. Jonathan is a friend of mine. He is a good dude. I really enjoy him and his channel. I try to keep this test, these observations, as neutral as possible and take that out. I informed him of that before I even had the idea to do this video. So this is as objective as I can be considering those two things. Also consider the fact that this is I think the second tool I ever bought, the first being a Veritas jack plane. So I have my biases towards Veritas in that regard as well. And consider I've owned and restored two different Stanley 71s over the years. And I sold both of them because I just don't like them. So I have my biases as everyone does. I tried to be as neutral in this observation and information as I can be. I hope that I was. On the controversy, one more time, very briefly, I really do think that the negative opinions of this tool and of JCAT's producing tools in general is a bias of the furniture community against the YouTube community. I'm not picking sides here. I belong to both communities and I love both communities, but furniture makers, woodworkers, properly educated joiners, however you want to call them, we, we can be elitist. And I think this is a case of these two have been around for a long time. There's a lot of people in the furniture world who are struggling to make a living and really busting their chops to make a name. And then JCats comes along with a wildly successful YouTube channel and then expands out into tool making. And I think it just rubs people the wrong way. That may be an unpopular opinion and that may be an incomplete opinion, but I don't think that it's unfair. I don't know how much more there is to say on it. That's my opinion on the matter, and I will leave it there because it is what it is. <sighs> so friends, that's that. I hope this video was interesting, and I hope it sheds some light on what I think is a little bit of a silly controversy or at a minimum, overblown. But I think I've said all that needs to be said on the topic, and I will leave you with this. From a functional standpoint, there is no difference between these tools. So whichever one fits your budget, whichever one you think will make you the happiest to use, that's the one you should buy. Because at the end of the day, if you don't enjoy using the tool, you're not gonna pick it up and use it when you need it, so it was a waste of money. So that's that. I got things to build, so I'm gonna go get to it. So friends, as always, thanks for stopping by. Go make a thing, and until next week, cheers.